Well, good morning. My name is Dan. I'm with the media team here at French Church. and I'm so excited to welcome you to French Church Online. Uh, it's just a great place to be. If you're new to Friends and you want to get to know a little bit more about our church, I would love to direct you to our services online at chfriends.church. Uh, from there, you can uh, sign our connection card, submit it back to us, and we can follow up with you. It's a great way for you to connect with us and, and us to connect with you and ultimately, ultimately connect with God. Uh, well, if you've, if you've been with us for the last few weeks, we are in our beloved series, uh, which is a book series, and today we're in John uh, 1 John chapter 3, verses 11 through 18. Uh, it's just been a very impactful series so far. Uh, I'm excited to get into worship so we can get to our message today and really, really see what God has for us. Um, so let's, without any further ado, let's just head on in. Let's head on into worship uh, and just praise the Lord. God bless.
Beyond all men. 
How we treat others really matters. Maybe you recognize that in your own life and, and as you're, you're maturing and growing, you realize how important uh, how we treat others truly is. We have a, an opportunity as we study uh, 1 John chapter 3 today, um, as he presents this idea of how we treat others. It's a test. It's a mark on how we treat others. How we treat others really matters. And we're going to focus on that today. The last section that we looked at last week, we, we saw that, that John was trying to get to the issue of identity, that we who are followers of Jesus are actually children of God. We have been adopted and grafted in. And, and so... Uh, and what that means in today's passage is a direct application of being a child of God, being born with a new seed. Um, and so we're going to see in today's passage love and hate in its various forms defined. And so um, there are basically two ways that we treat people, kind of foundational ways that we treat people. Number one is, is the natural way. This is, this is the way that is, is normal for everybody in this world who are non-Christian. And then there's another way, and that's uh, called uh, you know, a, a supernatural way. This is a, a, um, a response in how to treat people from the resources of God, a supernatural way. Let me give you an example. Natural way basically says this, that I treat you the way you treat me. It's kind of our own twist on the golden rule. However you treat me, that's how I'm going to treat you. If you hate me, I'll hate you back. If you're indifferent and you don't really care about me, well then, I don't care about you. You know, we have a phrase for that in our culture, and it's called, you're dead to me kind of idea that, that uh, you, you just don't even matter enough to even be in my universe. So I'm indifferent. And uh, then another way is, if you love me, then I'll love you back. So, you know, hate, indifference, and love can, can flow out of this natural uh, uh, way of treating other people. So there's a supernatural way, though. A supernatural way is not um, treating people the way they treat us, but it is treating people the way God treats us. See, there's a big difference in that. And so the natural way is to treat others as they treat um, uh, us, and, but the supernatural way is we treat people the way God treats us. See, that's the story of the Bible. The Bible is all about that because when God created this world and he created mankind specifically to be objects of his love and, and, and also in the sense that we would love him back, but we hated God. We rebelled against him. He gave us one rule and we could not abide that one directive we hated it. We wanted our own way. And so how did God respond? Did he hate us? Or did he 
um, say, oh, well, I don't care. I'll go create another planet. You guys just destroy yourself. And oh, well, indifferent approach. No, he didn't, he didn't deal with it in terms of theory and, and emotions, but in action and in truth. God himself came and dwelt among us, gave his only life, I mean, his life for us, that we might be in a love relationship with him and have the resources and to be able to follow him and not rebel. See, most of us, if we're honest, we were indifferent to God when, before we were uh, Christians. You know, most people in this world are indifferent to God. That's fine with you, but, I mean, for you, but, you know, I'm indifferent. I don't really care. I don't know, and I don't care. There are some, though, that are, um, uh, their, their lives maybe are marked by hatred of God. You know, many atheists or those people who have been hurt by the church in a sense, they're, they're not just um, indifferent. They're anti. They're anti-Christ. They're anti-God. Because the, the, this hurt me. This is not right. And I don't like that. And I don't uh, want that. So as a young man, I encountered supernatural love. It was at the right time in the right moment where God spoke into my heart, brought circumstances around, brought people around, got, brought the seed of the truth of God's love to me. And I realized that, that Jesus didn't come to be served. It wasn't some kind of religion that we're just serving him. But he came to love. And not only to love in word, but in deed, by sacrificing himself. That uh, he came to purchase us back, to care for us, to, to love us. And so, um, John was an eyewitness of this. The, uh, the author of this book, 1 John. Um, he was an eyewitness of this love that Jesus had. And that if you are a Christian, you've experienced this love. They saw, he saw them kill his best friend, Jesus. He was at the foot of the cross as he died. Um, it, it, he goes on in his life and he didn't give up. He didn't surrender then. He, he also saw his uh, other friends all die at the hands of people who hated and so what does John do in response to all this murder and hate after witnessing the love and the self-sacrifice of Jesus? What does he do? He says, I want to talk about love. I'm going to write a gospel about the person of love, Jesus, God himself coming incarnate. He's the way, the truth, and the life. God, he doesn't just love. He is love. And, and I'm going to, um, you know, talk about how to respond with supernatural love in our own relationships. I might throw in a little, little twist of end times stuff in there just to keep you excited about this. But wouldn't we agree that the world would be a better place if we just loved each other more? But here's the problem. We agree with that, but we don't live it. And why is that? I think, you know, it's this natural versus supernatural way in how we treat people. So I want to talk about from this passage today, three ways to treat people. And we're going to see the natural way and we're going to see the supernatural way. So let's go ahead and start in verses 12 and 13 of chapter 3 of 1 John. For this is the message you have heard from the beginning. That we should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. See, he starts this passage and he uses this a couple times in here from the beginning. He's trying to point back. You know, it's a, it's a new uh, command, but it's not a new command. It's an old command. And, and he's saying from the beginning, he says, it was God's intention from the very beginning 
for us to love. In fact, in the book of Le- Le- Leviticus, which we always see as a very religious, harsh, legalistic type book in the Bible, Leviticus 19, 8, uh, 18 says this, Love your neighbors as yourself. Love your neighbors as yourself because God is God. God is the Lord. It says in John chapter 13, By this they will, uh, they will know you by your love. It has always been God's intention for love to be the main thing. And so a supernatural mark of, of a follower of Jesus is love. It says that the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of God living in you, is love. The evidence of God's work in your life is love. And so that's what we're going to focus on. If we treat people in a supernatural way, the world will notice. The world will notice if we're treating people in a supernatural way and not just the natural Whatever you do to me, I'll do back to you. An eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You know, that kind of thing. It's, see, that's the natural way. Um, but it points. When people see us love with a supernatural source, they begin to say, hey, where is that coming from? Because I know I'm not loving, so why are they loving me? So the source must be somewhere. So we should love, but we don't love, right? And and he goes on in verse 12 and he says, don't be like Cain. So what is this? He goes on and he gives a case study of love and hate um, through the story of Cain and Abel. And uh, so this, this starts us with the first of the three different ways we treat people. Number one is through Hatred. No matter how many wars are fought, no matter how many uh, protests are made, no no matter how many rules or laws or regulations are are put into place, no matter how much reparations are paid, if the human condition is not dealt with, then uh, we will continue to behave in a natural way the way we've always behaved, not supernaturally. You do something to me, I do it to you. If you love me, I'll love you back. But if you hate me or indifferent, I will do that uh, back. In in fact, um, we we think of this idea of lack of love and 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 all those different things as as something maybe new, that it's maybe worse now than it's ever been. And I, I, I share with this with you a lot. When you're in the fire, you think this is the biggest fire there ever was. But the reality is um, this problem of love and hatred and indifference has been from the very beginning, as John says, In fact, Matthew chapter 24, verse 12, Jesus referring to the end times, and he says, because of wickedness, the love will grow cold. As the world spirals and we get more wicked and more rebellious, that love will grow cold. I mean, Jesus even said it. Marking the end times, he said, the love of many will grow cold. Love will not be a characteristic that people will see. Um, Romans chapter 1, again, is talking about how the the decline of culture and and, um, people who do not follow Christ. He says that people will be without love. Without it. Jesus says it's going to be... uh, grow cold, and, and Paul says there's going to be people without love. Or maybe it's redefined love that says the natural way of love is right. You treat me well, I'll treat you well. You're indifferent to me, I'll hate you. You know, whatever it is. So, you know, here's the thing with, with Cain and Abel in this story. We like to blame our uh, genetics or our upbringing on 
uh, misbehavior and, and problems and those kinds of things, right? But, but Cain couldn't do that because Adam and Eve, the first humans, were about as perfect of parents as you can possibly have. Genetics hadn't had a chance to, to distort and deteriorate. Um, uh, levels of evil had not escalated. In fact, in those days, they lived hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years uh, long. Uh, the, the creation had not uh, felt as, as damaging the, the, the effects of sin and, and human choices that it is today. And so we can't blame our parents. We can't blame our genetics. And, and we like to blame our culture as well that, you know, that, uh, oh, it's the culture that's causing all this love and, I mean, lack of love and hate and indifference and all those things. No, it's not the culture. It, it is, they were just family. This was just one family. Yes, it had multiplied over uh, hundreds of years, but it was one major family. They were all one community. And so we can't blame it on culture. Culture was what they made and created. And so Cain and Abel were, um, uh, Cain was a farmer and Abel was a rancher. And so um, both of those jobs are good jobs and they're both needed uh, for, for survival and feeding people and, and all those kinds of things. But so, so God told uh, Cain and Abel to bring their offerings, their first fruits to him, and they brought their offerings. Uh, Cain brought his grains um, and uh, Abel brought his... his um, uh, cattle or whatever it was he, he brought as a sacrifice. And, and the Bible says that God rejected Cain's offering. Now, there's kind of theories about why did he reject, because it's not as explicit here. But why? Why did God accept Abel's offering and uh, reject Cain's? Why? Most likely, it was not what was in their hands that they brought to God, but it was what was in their hearts. See, God cares not just what we bring in our hands, um, but also what's in our hearts. He cares about both, what's in our hearts and what's in our hands. Now, if God told um, uh, Abel to bring uh, um, a sacrifice of, of animals, then it would be the hands issue. But if he didn't, it would also be a heart issue. So either way, uh, what was going on here is, is that true love and, and true worship involves uh, hands and hearts. It involves what you bring to worship and what is inside of you that motivates and drives. So Hebrews chapter 11 describes Abel, and it says this, that Abel brought his offering by faith. By inference, he's, he's saying that Cain did not bring his offering by faith. By faith, meaning he trusted, he, he relied upon, he believed. Um, but Cain brought his offering from manipulation of God. It was from a, a uh, see, Cain had heart issues. It was from a place that said, I will do it in an outward way. I'll give you an offering from an outward way, but I'm bitter about it. I don't like it. Uh, Cain uh, did not just murder his brother by going from zero to murder in this one little instance. See, something had been stewing in Cain's heart, whether it was jealousy or, or selfishness or resentfulness towards God or, or whatever it was. We need to know that God looks at both our hands and our hearts when it comes to worshiping Him. And you know, today, here we are at worship. We're, we're here. We do this to, 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 as a time of devotion and, and focusing on God and worshiping Him. We worship Him in song. We worship Him in, in our giving. We worship in our, our service and our, our expression of love to Him. Um, so what, I just say, what did you come to worship with today? Your hands, 
your mouth? Or, I mean, do you, did you come with, with an attitude of, of um, this is what you blessed me with. I'm giving it back to you. You've given me a voice. I will sing and declare your goodness. I will bring my family who you blessed me with to you today. That's bringing God what's in your hands. But maybe, let me ask the, another question. What did you bring today to worship in your hearts? Maybe you're thinking, well, I got to do my church thing. Um, maybe you're, you, you know, you're thinking that maybe I, I, uh, I'm just trying to appease God, just do my religious duty. Did you bring jealousy? Did you bring anger? Did you bring um, unforgiveness? Um, or, I mean, I don't think many of you that are watching have committed murder, but may, that may be so in a, in a physical sense. But murder in a hate sense. Do you bring that today? See, some think that... that God knows my heart, so I don't, it doesn't really matter how I worship Him. So, you know, I'll just, I'll worship Him and, you know, every, every month or so I'll worship God. Uh, he knows my heart about money, so I don't, I don't need to really give. I, he just knows my heart, and so it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, other people will serve, so... Um, God knows my heart. Does, is that the way God looks at your hands when you come to worship? See, um, a life lived for Him is not just merely a show. It's not just to show up to get your star for the week. He, we are to truly worship. That's one of our greatest callings is to worship God with all of our heart. So, another side of it, though, may be that you sing boldly. You're excited about uh, being at church. You bring your offering. You volunteer. But you don't offer up your heart. You don't say, God, search me and know me and create in me a clean heart. You're just on the surface doing the things that appear right. See, both sides, the hands and the heart are important. Let's go on in verse 13. It says this, Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life, be, life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death, and anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. So when we love, John says, he says, do not be surprised. You know what the, 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 the original language actually says? says, stop being surprised. You, you should know this. You should expect this. Um, see, when, when we love, we need, to be expect, we need to expect to be hated. Why? What, it, what do you mean, Tweed? What, do you, what, what is John saying here? Because natural thinking says... If you love, I will love you in return. But that's, now, that's not how the natural, um, uh, that's how it works in the natural world. But in, in supernatural sense, uh, when we love, it is not motivated because they first loved us, but because God first loved us that we love. See, the anti-God the Antichrist, like we talked about last week, uh, culture will hate you because it's not natural. It's, it's something different. See, Jesus isn't a priority um, for us. He is the center of everything for us. So an Antichrist or, or, or those who, who would hate uh, believers would say, um, Something else must be in the center of our lives, not Christ. We don't want His views and His ideas. We want our views and our ideas. 
So um, the worldly view would say that our greatest hope, our deepest affections, our our most strong longings uh, and devotions in this life are are things of my choosing. Anything but not of Jesus. That's the worldly thinking. You know, the reality is, is when we love with supernatural love, it shines a light and the world doesn't like it. It says something is wrong with the world, but this is what we want. Sometimes Christians get hated and despised and opposed uh, because we deserve it, right? We, we act up. We act in non-loving ways. We act in hateful ways and in different ways. Definitely not lining up with the Spirit of God inside us. So, but when we get hated for doing the right things, for holding on to truth, for echoing God in this world, I mean, what did Abel do to deserve murder? You know, who sinned? You know, was it Abel? No, clearly, uh, Cain was the one, and it says there, that why did he kill him? Because Abel did what was right, and Cain did what was wrong. See, the world will hate you when you do what is right, and you love, and you care. And maybe when you speak the truth, they'll hate us. So we don't have to argue with the world um, to prove that we're right. You know what? uh, One of the ways you can know that you're right is the world hates you. You you know, in, in reality, the world will hate you no matter what. If you compromise, if you try the the hardest you can to be loved and accepted by the world, you will still not be loved. You will be hated. Um, See, because people are invested in the world, these world systems. So do you remember telling your friends and family the first time you accepted uh, the Lord into your heart and your new faith? You, 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 were, you were just so thrilled what God had done in your life. I mean, uh, you became a Christian and, and you said, I just discovered God loves me and I'm a child of God and I, he loves you too. And you're just so thrilled and excited. Were they excited for you? I know I had that kind of particular instance when I went and told my family and it was met with, mm, okay, now what do we got to deal with, you know, because um, they were unhappy that I had become a Christian. Uh Uh-oh, uh-oh, how dare someone become a Christian? See, this kind of idea plays out politically and socially and culturally. Why? Because it, it is kingdoms in conflict. It is God's kingdom, his rule, uh, versus the rule of, of this world, the father of this world, which is Satan. And so if you stand up and you say what God says, not what you think he said, what he clearly says in his word, that God created man and woman, and he created marriage, you will be hated. You're not saying that that humans that aren't following God are are some kind of um, people that need to be hated? No. That they can't have rights? No. It's that God said this, so we trust this. You know, um, if if you do that kind of thing, you speak up against the culture and and the the general consensus of belief in our culture, in our world, you better wear a helmet because the hate's coming. Okay, so here's the thing. Love isn't denying the truth. It's not even adapting the truth. It is reflecting the truth with care care. And with love, see, we think that sometimes, I mean, this pressure to compromise our biblical convictions uh, will always be there. You know, we we don't want to be hated. Who wants to be hated? 
And so we want to compromise. We want to mellow. We want to, to, to kind of be silent. See, but here's the real question. It's not, um, uh, will we be hated by this world? But are we more concerned with uh, offending the world or with offending God? It comes down to that. We must be more concerned with what God says and who He is and who He says I am. You know, we need to be careful. God is, never says just go out ranting and raving how, how everybody's condemned. He says, I have come that you might have life. We need to go with the life-giving message of Jesus. See, we don't want to try to be offensive in this world. We want to be gentle and persuasive, not haughty and harsh and and self-righteous. And so anytime we're behaving in that way, we are belittling. We're being hateful in the presentation of the good news. And that's crazy. So, um... We will love the people in this world, yet know that it will not be reciprocated. You love, you won't be loved in return. In fact, you most likely will have hatred come your way. See, our love is, and does that mean we just stop loving the world? No, because our love is a light. Our love is a seed for God to to bring life to others. Our, our life is, is an offering. Our love is an offering to a broken world. Jesus came to serve and to love and to sacrifice. And so um, love for us is a mark and a test. It's a mark that shows that you're Christian. If you love It's a mark that we have to have. If you don't have it, you're not Christian. It's also a test, a test that proves our faith. If you love the way Jesus loved, then it proves your faith is real. And so John is nailing that. See, God didn't put life in our lives so that I can go and kill others. He didn't give me life so I could take a life. See, murder originates in a heart of hate. And so we see murder. um, I mean, one of my favorite scenes from uh, Lord of the Rings, uh, the Two Towers, I think it was, that um, uh, when when Gollum and and uh, uh, Smeagol were were having their conversation together and they, uh, they did it amazingly in this movie and they're talking and back and forth and it's this this self-talk and and then the final words are murderer you know the reality is 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 if we live our lives rebellious against god we ultimately are murderers um i'll give you some examples we 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 may not shoot someone or stab someone or you know anything like that but We want to murder people's reputations by saying things. We want to murder businesses. We want to cause pain and financial stress on a person so to take them down. Um, We we see uh, murder happening in relationships and socially and, and maritally as we seek to do harm to others. You know, this whole cancel culture, all it is is hatred in a nice, you know, in in a justifiable way. It is is a form of social murder that, um, yeah, maybe I might might not be taking their life, but I'm punishing them. I'm destroying them. Cancel culture is hatred. It's, It's not like I murdered anyone, though. Well, here's what Jesus has to say about that. You want to know what Jesus has to say about This, Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 22. You have heard that it was said of those, uh, to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. Verse 22 says, But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. 
Everyone, um, or it says, whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell, uh, to the hell of fire. See, what, what Jesus is, is doing is, is escalating. It's not, you know, murder. We, you know, that's a very clear line. But Jesus is saying, you think just because you don't stab someone, uh, you know, chop them up, you're not murdering them? You still do the judgment. And he says um, that actions and intentions are important. Hating someone is equal to murder in the sight of God. Hatred is evil in the sight of God. And it should never be a part of any Christian's life or soul. How do you know if you hate someone? He says it right here, anger. You know, if anyone is angry with his brother, he's liable. Anger, he's talking about an anger that's taking root in a person's life. He, uh, he goes on and says, whoever insults his brother. I mean, this is name calling, insulting. Uh, see, words are like uh, swords stabbing. Why do we come up with derogatory language and insults? Why do we do that? To bring pain. It's a, it's a, it's a form of, of murder. And so, yes, we do need to self-censor um, our own insults and our own name calling that, that develops between people. See, naturally, the natural way says you, you give back what you got. The spiritual way says God's way back, uh, truth in love and forgiveness in love. That's what God's way says. That's the supernatural way. So, so let's just talk about this for a second. So, so um, actions and intentions are important, but, but what if someone does something wrong to you? What are we called to do? To forgive. Forgive is, is not just okaying someone's sin. It is passing it on to a higher court. Saying that um, by taking the life of God in me, um, I'm not going to demand death of someone else because I have the life already. See, the nicknames. You know, people you love you will give a nickname to. Um, I don't know, uh, uh, you know, in our family, nicknames are, you know, very common. We call each other uh, uh, cute names. Cindy's uh, one of my favorites of hers is she called me Pumpkinhead. I don't know where that one came from, but that's one of her uh, nicknames. Uh, we nickname people that we love, but we also nickname people that we hate. You know why? Because we create a caricature of that, that makes... Our enemy is a caricature. It, it dehumanizes them. And so we no longer even relate to them as a human. So we have no guilt at, at berating them and derogatorily talking about them and, and asking for judgment upon them. We're, we're no longer dealing with them. We are cultivating hate in our own heart. We're dealing with our own hate like Cain was dealing with Abel. And ultimately, ultimately he murdered him. So hatred is never the right response. I need to quickly go through these last two ways we treat. One is hatred through the natural way. And, and uh, then another way is through indifference. This is another way we treat people. We either can hate or we can treat them indifferently. In uh, verses 16 through 17, it says this. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or a sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? So I just want to, uh, I have a lot to say here, but I better um, uh, focus in. There's a couple things that, that are pointed out in this passage. It says that... Um, Again, this is how we know that what love is. Jesus' example is what love is. He laid down his own life, and it says we ought to 
do the same. We ought to lay down our lives for who? Brothers and sisters. He's talking about those in the faith we are to lay down our lives for. If anyone has material possessions, he starts to expand it. He says, if anyone has material possessions and sees his brother or sister in need um, and has no pity on them, how is the love of God in them? So he says here, as a principle about love, love gives. Love gives. You know, it says in one place in scripture that where your treasure is, there your heart is also. You know, some people think that that how we spend our money is not really that important of an issue. But the reality is, is how I use my money is of utmost importance. Um, see, because the question is, um, is it my money? Do I give to God? Do I not give to God? The bigger question is, whose money is it in the first place? You know, uh, in our rooted um, discipleship experience, we talk about money. And we talk about the idea that we are managers, not owners. That God has given us a stewardship. And that's how we view our lives and our resources and our time that we are to give, we are to, to develop and cultivate a, a generous life that, that is giving of self, not just money, but money is just one example he gives here. It is meeting needs. If you see a need, meet it. If, if your brothers and sisters are around you and, and they are in need, do something. See, love gives. See, and that, that's our... Um, uh, brings us to our third point is, is the idea of love. See, the first two uh, are natural responses. But this third one is the key, especially for those who are followers of Christ. We are to love. We are to love in a supernatural way. He goes on and says, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and truth. You know, it, it's kind of uh, difficult with, with this kind of thing is, is how do you love someone that seems unlovable? You know, do you have to like everyone? Did, does God call us to like everyone? No. Some people are just unlikable. Uh, do, do we have to trust everyone? No, because some people are, are totally corrupt and they're not trustworthy and they're, they're harmful. Are we supposed to be close friends with everyone? No. We are to be um, friendly and friends with some. So how much love today is just sentimental junk is amazing. Much is said, but little is done. And so John is pointing us to the reality that, that love is not just in words and speech and what we say and what we feel. It is in actions, not just in actions, but in truth as well. You know, we talk a lot today about what everybody else should be doing. It's almost like everybody has this thing that's walking around saying, you need to do this. Instead of, I'm doing this, you need to do this. Um, instead of doing it ourselves, we want to force our ways upon someone else. The world is so messed up, so perverted, so selfish, that it gives the children of God during these times and these days a great opportunity to love, not just in words and sentimentality, but in truth and in action. You know, the cultural vibe that we have today is filled with anger and despising and victimhood. And, and uh, it, you know, it's anti-Christ. It's anti-God. So love uh, gives, but love also does. Jesus died for us. And, and that's love is not an emotion. It is love gives and it does and that's exactly what Jesus did. He loved the world so much that God gave his only son. He loved and gave. He uh, love gives and love 
does. In, in fact, let me just end with a couple uh, key scriptures. It says in um, uh, Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 15, and he's saying this to followers, and this is what we are to do to brothers and sisters. These are your uh, people of faith. This is this, the community of God. And he says this, he says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love. Sincerity in love. The purity and holiness of, of love. Cling to what is good and reject the evil. Be devoted to, mo- to one another in love. It says, honor one another above yourselves. Uh, elevating others. Never lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. How? Serving the Lord. If, if you've lost fervor for the Lord, you need to get involved in service. You need to start applying love, doing, not just saying and thinking about it. You need to do it. Love people. Love people groups. Minister. Uh, verse 12, be hopeful in joy, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. In verse 14, he says, bless. Uh, so we're, we're to share. We're to... Uh, practice hospitality. We're to bless those who persecute us and bless and do not curse. And verse 15 says, rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. You know, there's so many verses in scripture that that talk about the one another's and how we are to love one another and to serve one another and to forgive one another. We are to be a crucible of love, of supernatural love. Church, we've got to do it amongst ourselves. If we can't do it here, the world's not going to see it. The world's not going to receive it. We've got to be love. And it can't just be in-house. It's got to also go into the world. In fact, James chapter 1 verse 27 says that this is how we know you have authentic, true, loving, life-giving faith that you, you serve widows and you serve orphans. You care about the outcasts in our society. See, our mat- natural response to a messed up world can be hatred, indifference, and love in kind, which is the natural way. But we're to love like Jesus. I know I've said a lot today, but what is the application? What is the practical application for each of us? How you treat others is paramount. It is a mark and it is a test of your faith. You say you're a Christian, then show me your love. You you say you trust Jesus, then love even when you're hated. Love the brothers and sisters with all your heart. Love the world. Not being offensive and harsh and self-righteous, but with gentleness, presenting the love of Christ that while they're still sinning, we love them anyway. That's the kind of love we have. We are to love like Jesus. Don't be a Cain who cultivates this hatred and and hides it thinking that they're being loving. No, it will come out. Jesus expanded on just murder in the sense of killing, taking someone's life. It's also murdering their reputation, name calling, uh, anger that gives root to bitterness and all these things. We need to love like Jesus loved. Will you do that? Will you give to God uh, with hands and heart? Not just the appearance of being right, but the heart condition of of being right with God also. Bring it all and saying, God, search me and know me. Make me love like you love. The the life-giving love you gave me, help it to flourish in my heart and my life. Amen. I love you. And I encourage you, go and love brothers and sisters. Love your family. Love your enemies. And pray for your enemies. In this culture of war and division, 
Love is the answer. Supernatural love. God bless you and and, uh, have a great week. Uh, Join us again next week as we continue in the book of 1 John. Well, thank you so much, Pastor Tweed, for your message today from 1 John. Uh, it's, 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 like I said before, it's been a very impactful series for me personally, and I think uh, for, for a lot of other people as well. And again, if you are new to French Church, please check out our website, chfriends.church. Fill out our connection card, submit it to us, and let us follow up with you and, and get connected uh, with friends. So I want to thank you again for joining us. Take care. God bless.